So good morning, everyone. Good morning, lots of smiles. My name's Tony Penny. I'm the director of the Walter and Lenore Annenberg Presidential Learning Center here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. And on behalf of our entire team here at the foundation, it's my distinct privilege to welcome you to the Reagan Library. In his farewell address to the nation, President Reagan said, an informed patriotism is what we want. Here at the foundation, we work with students and teachers throughout the year to provide opportunities for the next generation of Americans to be engaged and thoughtful citizens and leaders. Democracy is not something that is passed on through the bloodstream. Like anything else worth doing, it requires a lot of learning, a lot of hard work, and a lot of experience. President Reagan observed, since the founding of this nation, education and democracy have gone hand in hand. Thomas Jefferson not only wrote the Declaration of Independence and served as the third president of the United States, but also founded one of our most distinguished institutions of higher learning, the University of Virginia. Well, today, we continue this long tradition of education and democracy with our second annual Simi Valley Youth Town Hall. I, for one, am very much looking forward to our conversation today, but you'll notice that the focus of our conversation today is youth, and this description has long since ceased to apply to me. So to formally kick off our program today, I'm going to turn it over to our student master of ceremonies from the Simi Valley Youth Council and Royal High School, Miss Emily Ramirez. Good morning and welcome to the second annual Simi Youth Town Hall at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. My name is Emily Ramirez. I'm a sophomore at Royal High School and a member of the Simi Valley Youth Council. Let us begin our day with members of the Youth Council assisting me with a flag salute. Everyone please stand. Thank you. Today's discussion will focus on three ongoing issues affecting the youth in our community. Underage substance abuse, the role of media in body image and health, and affordability of college. This is an opportunity for you to take an active role in your community by asking questions to elected officials about these issues that might impact you. If during the discussion you have any questions or comments, you can tweet them using the hashtag Sith2016, that's S-Y-T-H 2016. If you don't have a Twitter, you can text Sith 2016 to the number 22333 with your questions. You will be directing the discussion in today's venue, so if you want something to be covered, text or tweet away. It is an esteemed honor to have such distinguished panelists who have graciously volunteered their time to join us this morning to answer your questions and discuss concerns pertaining to the youth of Simi Valley. Our group of notable speakers are Congressman Steve Knight, representing California's 25th District, Mayor Bob Huber of the City of Simi Valley, Ms. Dee Dee Kavanaugh, the Director of the Board of Directors for the Ranch of Simi Recreation and Park District, and Dr. Jason Poplinski, Superintendent of the Simi Valley Unified School District. Our first panelist, Congressman Steve Knight, has served in the U.S. Army and was a police officer in the Los Angeles Police Department for 18 years. He has worked hard to support small businesses and restore the state's economic vitality. He believes that the best way to educate students should be made at the local level since every community has unique needs. Congressman Knight was elected in 2014 and currently represents the 25th District of California. Our second panelist, Mayor Bob Huber, is, very active, is a very active member of our community. He was elected mayor in 2010 and received the Citizen of the Year Award from the Simi Valley Chamber of Commerce in 1989. Mayor Huber manages to participate in many of our city events, from serving Thanksgiving dinner at the Senior Center to being a panelist in our very own Youth Town Hall. He also holds public town halls where residents can meet with him directly to discuss issues concerning the city's government. And you will definitely spot him around town attending ribbon cutting ceremonies in support of new local businesses. Our next panelist, Ms. Dee Dee Kavanaugh, in addition to being the director of the Rancho Simi Recreation and Parks District, is also vice president and regional, regional manager for the Pacific Western Bank. 
She grew up enjoying our city's parks and is a proud supporter of our community and wants us to utilize many of the programs and facilities within our park district so that our community can enjoy all that Simi Valley has to offer. Our final panelist, Superintendent Dr. Jason Paplinski, manages the instructional and non-instructional operations of the schools. He strives to make sure our schools are as effective and safe as possible. He has begun implementing innovative cutting edge technology and expanding social media outreach in our school district, bringing it into the forefront of the 21st century. Our four panelists brings with them a wealth of knowledge and a wide range of experience. We also have two youth council members on stage moderating our discussion. Prachi Patel from Santa Susana High School and Nicholas Mincer from Santa Susana High School. Please join me in welcoming our speakers and moderators to the stage. Welcome, good morning everyone. My name is Prachi Patel. I represent Santa Susana High School on the Simi Valley Youth Council, and I will be one of your moderators for today. We would like to start off by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us what they believe is the most vital and pressing issue for youth today. Am I up? Yeah. Well, good morning, thank you for having me here today. I am Stephen Knight, I am your congressman. I represent right here in Simi Valley, Santa Clarita Valley, and Antelope Valley. Uh, I think that a lot of the pressing issues we're going to talk about today, but understand that America is founded on certain principles, and those principles have to be guided in each generation. That's up to you now, of what we believe, how we're going to, still up there, how we're going to guide this generation, and what we're going to do in the future. My position as your leader in the House of Representatives is to watch what you want and to represent the needs of the community. But understand this, those needs have to be sound. And when you move forward with these types of discussion, understand that they have to be sound principles. We have to be able to pay for things. We have to be able to protect things. And we have to be able to guide the people to the next generation. So, that is, that is kind of my goal here today. I look forward to the questions, and, uh, and I thank you for letting me per to participate. Good morning. I'm Bob Huber. I'm the mayor of Simi Valley, and uh, this is uh, part of our youth council. The, uh, the city de deals with a, a very broad number of issues that involve young people. We have the Youth Council, we have Youth Employment Service, we have other ways that we help the young people. Narrowing in on the most pressing issue has been the most pressing issue. I'm in my sixth year as mayor, and I still believe it's the most pressing, press, pressing issue is the issue of substance abuse. And it's going to be, I'm going to go into too much detail because one of the questions we're going to talk about. But we've, we've been on the cutting edge of that in this city. and. My first uh, real awakening that this was a problem, because you, you, sometimes it has to hit you between the eyes, was right here in this very room. And it was in the late 2011 when the, uh, our police department co-sponsored a uh, forum here on th that very issue. And uh, we had the top individual from the Drug Enforcement Administration here from Washington, D.C. and. Uh, it, it was a, a real eye-opener for me. My disappointment was that the, the room was about maybe 35% filled with people. And uh, hopefully we're going to have another one of these because it, it really, uh, really is impactful. So I'm, I'm focused on that issue. I mean, obviously, there's other issues, too. It, and it, I'll talk a little bit more when it's my turn uh, because we're going to be asked questions on this issue. So I don't want to go into too much details on the substance abuse, but I believe that's the number one issue. And uh, thank you for all being here today. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank the uh, Ronald Reagan Presidential Library as well for allowing us to, to do this. This is our second year of doing it here. So uh, have a great day.
morning. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Dee Dee Kavanaugh. I feel one of the most pressing issues facing you, youth today, is your social media and the world that you're growing up in. We, my generation, did not have Facebook, did not have instant digital cameras, did not have the ability to be in contact 24 seven with somebody. So it's created a whole new world and a whole new world deal of problems, new situations, new thoughts. That's something that we have not experienced at all. So your generation is experiencing that and that's one thing that we as parents cannot help you with because we weren't there. So I think that's a very important issue and it is one of the things that we're, we're talking about. Um, there are various ways that it can be used positively and I think if we focus more on that and get our youth to focus more on the positive aspects of it, it will help us in the long run. So thank you for inviting me. Good morning, my name is Jason Poplinski and I have the great fortune of serving as the superintendent of all of your schools. And I'm very pleased to be here today. I think um, venues like this are awesome because we rarely consult the best educational experts that we have and that's our students. So this is a great opportunity to have a conversation with all of you. I think your greatest challenge, frankly, is, is sort of multifaceted, but I think it really boils down to the competitive nature that your lives have sort of been inundated with. Uh, your educational experience, admission to college, social media, body image, all those things that we're going to speak about today really um, have become really prevalent in your society and in your world. And I think for young people today, it's really important that we start changing the conversation again about what it's like to be a good neighbor, what it's like to be a good citizen. And that's why we're so proud of um, the partnership that we have with the Ronald Reagan Library, with some of our schools that focuses on civics learning and citizenship. So happy to be here today and look forward to the conversation. Hello everyone, my name is Nicholas Spencer and I'll be one of your moderators for today. I am a senior at Santa Santa High School, uh, Vice Chairman of the Simi Valley Youth Council. I was Master of Ceremonies for this event last year. So the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation went to various schools throughout Simi Valley and took polls on what they believe were the most pressing issues facing the youth in Simi Valley today. And our top three results were substance abuse, media slash body image, and concerns related to higher education. So to start our discussion today, I do want to remind you, um, do not forget that we have, you can uh, use Twitter to hashtag SYTH2016 to send in your questions, which we will address after each topic that we um, deal with our, um, excuse me, uh, we deal with our moderators. So our first topic today is going to be substance abuse. And my first question is for Congressman Knight. So when you voted on numerous bills while you were a California State Assemblyman from 2008 to 2012 and Senator from 2012 to 2014 that pertain to the severity of punishments from drug possession, what actions at the federal level can be taken against substance abuse that will affect the students of Simi Valley for the better? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back in time just a little bit. In 1990, I joined the Los Angeles Police Department, and I quickly found out that being a police officer meant that uh, you had to deal with an awful lot of problems. It didn't just mean watching it on TV and you know, chasing bad guys through the street, and then you go home, and all of these things happen. The next day, you're chasing bad guys through the streets, actually trying to fix problems and trying to help people. And so I learned very quickly that I'm going to deal with people that have uh, problems with substances, have problems with uh, how they grew up, different economic stages, and just having uh, bad luck for, for some folks, that they just found themselves in a bad situation. So I've, I've worked with substance abuse for uh, about the last 26 years. Over the last couple of years, you've seen a huge spike in heroin. Heroin has become the drug that people have jumped onto after they've uh, lost out on their prescription of painkillers or their oxys or things of that nature, and they've jumped onto a drug called heroin that they think is cheap that really isn't that cheap because your body builds a tolerance to heroin very quickly. So when you think it's a $10 drug, it soon becomes a $100 a day drug, and now it starts to overwhelm you. So we've seen a jump in the northeast of this country, uh, about three or 400% of overdoses of addicts on heroin. We've seen it throughout the country. Here in California, we've seen a spike uh, although here in California, we, we unfortunately tend to, uh, to jump the curve sometimes, and we have other drugs like methamphetamines and, and uh, crack and things like that that are hitting our streets and been on our streets for the last 25 years that have 
kind of taken over there. So what I've done is I'm on a heroin task force at the federal level. And we're looking at new ways to uh, how do doctors prescribe these painkillers? Are they prescribing on good, uh, good scientific evidence? Are they giving too much? Are people getting enough now counseling on how to take painkillers? And if you're, if you're kind of uh, prescribing yourself or over, overusing yourself, is there a counseling program that you can revert to? So uh, we've had one meeting here in the, in the city. Uh, I know the mayor was involved, and the mayor is extremely involved in, in uh, this issue. But uh, at the federal level, we're looking at uh, how we deal with physicians, um, what penalties we have for heroin. Heroin is a Schedule I drug, which means there is no medicinal value to it. And uh, what we're going to do in the future. Yesterday, I sat down with four doctors and talked to them about prescribing, what they do, and then what happens when somebody is maybe overusing, not overdosing, but overusing, and maybe tipping over and now becoming an addict on a painkiller. So those are the types of things that you're going to see at the federal level, and I think the task force will, will bring some of, those, uh, some of those issues to light. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, my second question is for you, Mayor Huber. So the city of Simi Valley already has numerous programs that advocate for drug prevention, such as the Task Force on Heroin, which you are a member of, Not One More, Above the Influence, and the County of Ventura Drug and Alcohol Programs. Yet our students voted that this is still one of our most pressing issues facing the youth in Simi Valley today. What do you think may be attributing to this? Thank you. I appreciate the question because I am involved in this issue. I said I'd elaborate a little bit more on the history because I think it's important to understand a little bit the background. Um, we, uh, we had a group of people come to a city council meeting about four years ago. Actually, I said a group, about 300, which is the largest, uh, largest attendance we've ever had, uh, probably in the history of the city, on this very subject. Okay, And from that, it evolved, and it was on, we meet on Monday night and Wednesday morning. I had a meeting with the uh, superintendent of schools, the chair of the Board of Education, the uh, chair of the Recreation Park District, the general manager of the Recreation Park District, the city manager and I. We had, coincidentally, just a couple of days later, had this meeting. And so out of that formed a, the, the six of us took back to our respective agencies to bring everybody together. So we met all, all five members of each particular uh, elected bodies, 15 of us, and we, from that, we, we had the uh, heroin, we have the Heroin Prevention Task Force Committee. And it's, it's evolved, for instance, an example, I'm talking about in terms of us trying to get our arms around it. In the very beginning, the school district had, uh, the, the superintendent of schools uh, had a, a, a rule that the principals could decide whether or not the canine jo dogs would be allowed on the campuses. So a number of campuses, the canine dogs, and I'm talking about the, the drug-sniffing dogs, okay? So a number of the principals didn't want them on the campus. Well, that changed. They're on, we come random now, okay? That changed, and, there's, and I can go on and on and on. We've involved the schools in a lot of this, and the youth in a lot of it. Uh, the signs that uh, we, we put up at the uh, bus stops, okay? Uh, Santa Susana, performing our school, uh, students did those signs. And so we've tried to bring, bring the, the young community into this. Youth councils deals with this. We have a very broad uh, task force. Two members of the school board, two members of the park board, two members of the city council, uh, two members from not one more, two members from the faith-based community, and the chair of the board of the Chamber of Commerce. And all the, the uh, professional heads of the organizations attend our meetings as well. And this is evolving. Um, about six months after we formed the task force, I got a call from uh, Dr. Phil, the television um, Dr. Phil. And, one, and the, they felt that we were the leaders in the United States stepping out on this issue because most communities don't want to talk about it because it's a bad for, for business and bad for this and that and the other. Well, the way you deal with this is you put it up. And you talk about it. You don't ignore it because we've got to get our arms around it, okay? And so we, we went on to Dr. Phil. He committed that he, to us that he wouldn't make us the heroin capital of the United States, that we were the leaders in the country. And because of that, there's not a lot of not one more chapters now in the country because of the of people coming to us for advice on how to handle this. 
but it's an evolving thing. It's an evolving thing. And what happens is you can have a really good student who is, is a perfect person in terms of not having problems, and then go to a party, and someone can give them, and they, someone who's, who's on drugs could give them an Oxycontin, and they can be hooked just like that, okay? And all of a sudden, so they're trying to get Oxycontins, which is probably $100 a day, okay? Uh, too expensive, so that's why they went to heroin, and I'm using stats, they're probably older, maybe more than that now. $15 a day. So we're, what we're doing at the task force, okay, is we're trying to do a very extensive, with, with our colleagues from the, from the schools and the parks and the faith-based and the Chamber of Commerce, we're trying to get the word out, okay, because education is a key thing. And, um, you know, people don't want to talk about it, but you need to talk about it. And, we're, you know, we're doing a lot of, uh, of things in terms of education because that's the key from our standpoint is educating people, and then when you see programs that get involved, because we are, we are connected with other agencies and getting people help and this, that, and the other. So it's, it's bringing everybody to the table, trying to get a handle on this. But we here are committed to talking about it. A lot of communities aren't. A lot more now are starting to talk about it because you're not gonna solve the problem unless you admit that you have a problem. So we're working hard at it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All righty, my third question is for Dr. Pablinski. So, according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, 23.6% of 12th grade students use some sort of illicit drug over the past year. In Simi Valley, many of our students are witnessing accounts in which their peers are using these types of drugs, which is why it's at the center of our conversation today. Marijuana is being used by 34.9% of 12th graders, including many students of our schools. How can our school system create a more safe, comfortable, an anonymous environment for students who are dealing with these issues to easily receive support. Well, clearly this is um, uh, an issue that has, is not a new issue. Um, we have a different way of talking about it than we have in the past. And I will tell you that th these statistics are national statistics and some of you have participated in our California Healthy Kids Survey. So happy to say that Ventura County's numbers and Simi Valley um, numbers are actually lower than that. But um, it still is an alarming number of students that have access and exposure and have tried some of these drugs. I think that the way we used to talk to students about drugs, being in the Reagan Library, everybody has heard um, from Mrs. Reagan's uh, campaign, Just Say No, We've, we all know that campaign. And the answer sometimes we talk about always is we have to do more education. Well, let, let's try a little experiment. How many know smoking is bad for you? How many know drinking is bad for you? Obviously, we can go up the list. So we've, we've educated you. you. You know these things are not good for your bodies. So how are we still having an alarming number of students find access to and try these things? It goes back to what I said in the beginning. I think it's about the pressures of social pressures that you now experience. I think it's familial changes that we've had over the past decades in our country. And I think that the way we talk to youth about drug use has to change. The way we did it 30 years ago is, is not effective anymore. You have access. Some of you probably right now are freaking out because your cell phone has been buzzing in your pocket. You have access to things that you have not had access for, to in the past. And so in terms of the school district, I think it goes back to, again, talking about what it means to be a good classmate, to be a good neighbor, to be a good citizen. You are going to recognize in your friends far before um, a teacher or a counselor or a principal recognizes behavior changes in your closest friends. And you have a duty and a responsibility to seek assistance for those people. That's what being a good citizen is in my mind. So I think in terms of the school system, you should know we do have anonymous reporting. Um, you d we do have all of these programs. We have all these educational programs. We have cessation programs. But if you're not accessing them, they're not successful. So I would encourage all of you to take it upon yourself to keep your eyes and ears open in your circle of friends. And I think that, as I, as I indicated earlier, I think that what you face on a daily basis, not only on social media, but in your peer groups, is something unlike we went through as young people. It was much easier for us to, um, to walk away from some of those challenges and some of those pressures than I think it is for some of you today. 
So I would say just be open to the fact that you likely are going to be the person that notices a change or a use in your friends before an adult does. And um, you have that responsibility to report that to someone trusted at your school. That can be the janitor. That can be your counselor. That can be a trusted teacher. That can be the principal. That can be a parent. And I, if, if you sit back and watch those things happen to a classmate, then I um, would say that that is not uh, what would we would be asking and expecting of you as a fellow classmate in our district. Thank you very much. My final question on this topic goes to Director Kavanaugh. So, as I've just mentioned to Dr. Poblinski, our students see substance abuse in Simi Valley as a major issue and want to see actions taken to reduce drug and alcohol usages. Does the Rancho Simi Recreation and Park District offer any programs or support groups to help current users? And what can we expect in the future from the RSRPD regarding this issue? Thank you. Who would have thought that Parks and Recreation would have to deal with drug issues at this point in time? That's not <laughs> something that was in our past, but it is one of the areas that is a concern of the world and our students <coughs> today. So yes, in um, answer to your question, we do have certain programs. Um, we, I, pardon my notes, I wanted to make sure that I covered everything. Um, I had thought of a couple, but I checked with our staff. So we help host reality parties um, where the youth can be actors and show the parents how and what happens in them. But one of the biggest things that we have found from the Park District's point of view is if you have something to do and if you are kept active, you are less likely, hopefully, to have a drug problem. So that's one of the areas that we concentrated in. We have a lot of adult classes that teens are eligible to take. If you look in our recorder every uh, quarter when we send it out, there are hundreds of classes that you can take on, in your free time to have fun with your friends, alone, that type of thing. We also have special ones that are designed specifically for your age group, such as caricature, cartooning, crafting, online driver's ed. I think some of you might want that. We also have a youth mental health first aid that we offer to the parents to help identify um, drug abuse or the symptoms of it because they are different from what we experienced in the past. We, one of our newest things that I'm very proud of is we have a youth hockey outreach program that's becoming successful. We have almost 20 registered students attending that, and that's on a referral basis. So they play hockey, they have a sport. Some of these kids have never been in ice skates before, but they're learning something, and then they have a discussion in the warm room afterwards to talk about what is on their minds, the things that are bothering them, um, the issues that have come up recently, and they can get support and guidance from their peers, as well as from respected and trusted adults. One of the other things that Dr. Poplinski said in regards to anonymous um, uh, notifications, what I wanted to mention too is I am a member of the Simi Valley Police Foundation board. We have an anonymous app. If you, go to the, if you download the Simi Valley PD app, one of the things there is an anonymous tips, tip point. You can do it either by your name or anonymously. It also lists all the SROs throughout the school district. And it has a lot of other things that you might be able to use as a student to help with this type of, of event. One of my final things is, is to help avoid this type of thing is to keep our parks clean. We have rangers, as most of you probably know. Our ranger's job is to assist the Simi Valley Police Department in maintaining our parks. So they will help and they will patrol them at odd hours, they will try and keep people out of the park district or out of the parks that shouldn't be there. They will help assist um, with anybody if you have a problem. If you notice there's somebody in a restroom that might be doing something they shouldn't be doing in regards to drugs, you can call our rangers. A lot of times they're at our parks. They're, we close our restrooms at night so that they're not accessible. So we're trying in all the different ways um, to, to make it a safe environment for our youth. And hopefully, as time goes on, that will become more the norm than, than, than what it is now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Now it's time to take questions from the audience submitted online. Let's check with our social media team to see what questions you guys have asked. On the subject of drug abuse, Mira Huber, what course of action do you believe a student should take if they think they have a friend is suffering from a drug abuse problem? We have the, uh, the uh, 
as, as was mentioned earlier, we have the uh, anonymous uh, hotline so they can call in, okay, and talk on that. Also, if it's their friend, they can encourage their friend to, to uh, seek help and be a mentor for their friend. So that would be the, the key ways to deal with that as I see it. One of the things, too, that has been really helpful for the uh, Heroin Prevention Task Force has been the input from people, young people, from youth council, what have you. So we encourage you to get involved. And, and by the way, on, on, um, on Monday, we do have a drug issue, just in a few days, on our city council meeting. Uh, it's, it's what has to do with marijuana, okay, and outlawing marijuana in our city. Uh, the state has requir required us to now deal with this before they deal with it. They want to know where the cities are coming from. So encourage your parents or you as well, come and testify on this subject because it's a gateway drug. And uh, we, want to, we want to reel it in as best we can. Thank you. For Congressman Knight, this is from Lillian Marion on Twitter. If drug abuse is a huge issue in Simi Valley, then why was funding for D.A.R.E. cut? Well, that's a good one. <laughs> well, I guess I'm going to have to uh, get a little bit more help on the question. But what, what I will uh, put out from what I understand from the question is, is funding cut at the federal level as opposed to funding cut at the county or state level? So funding that is coming from the federal level you're pointing. Funding that's coming from the federal level. If funding is cut, there are two different reasons why it is cut. One is we can't afford it. Second is uh, somebody has taken that money and put it somewhere else. So because of the drug problems that we're having in America, there is money that's being funded into programs like the Heroin Task Force, like some of these other issues that are kind of flooding the country. But the the DARE funding uh, goes right down to the police departments. And uh, the police departments use that money to put out officers at the schools, to go out and do uh, drug uh, assistance kind of education. That's exactly what uh, DARE is. And, uh, and I think that that funding is taken away because they want to put it into other programs. But let me kind of take that question and, and use it in a in a better way. The money that's being used for drug help, to get addicts off drugs, to make sure that young people are not getting on drugs, is still coming down to the local level. It's still coming down to the county level. There are still an abundance of county programs at each county, in Ventura, and LA, and Orange County. There's still an abundance of drug programs that you can access. That money, too, is can, can be funded down into the city level, and the city level can produce their own programs. If you don't use that money and you use it for something else, then you can call it a cut. But actually, that money has been increased over the years, and more federal money has been increased. It just hasn't been used for these types of programs. It's been funneled into other programs because we have such an epidemic with certain drugs. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to our second topic of discussion today, which is media and body image. My co-moderator and I will be going back and forth asking questions about this topic. So once again, Congressman Knight, um, many students live in constant fear of being accepted by others, and a lot of these problems stem from not being confident in one's body image. According to a recent poll by Today slash AOL, 25% of boys and 30% of girls in grades 7 through 12 reported being teased by their peers about their weight. What can we do as a society to promote body positivity and become more accepting of other body types? Yeah, so I'm going to use some of the uh, other uh, panelists' uh, views on some of these issues. One is, this is a different time. When I grew up, when I was in high school, we didn't have a computer. We didn't have a cell phone. Uh, if somebody teased you, you went home, and uh, you kind of dealt with it at that level. But right now, if somebody teases you, I have Instagram on my phone, I have Twitter on my phone, I have Facebook on my phone. I used to have Tumble when that was something. Um, 
So if somebody teases you, they certainly will go home or they'll do it right there and I'm sure that they will go on social media and say uh, this about somebody. That's a problem and that's an issue. Uh, I myself, because I'm a congressman, I get uh, ridiculed every day, but that's part of my job. Uh, it's not part of your job to get ridiculed by your peers or by friends about how you look uh, or maybe an activity that you like to do. But unfortunately, in today's day and age, that is what you're living with. As I tell my sons, I have two sons, one's 17, one's 22. One's graduating high school this year, one's graduating college this year. And I ask them about politics all the time because this is the generation that maybe I don't understand as well. I understand my generation, but I don't understand your generation as well as I should. So I talk to them all the time about this. And I said, you know, one of the interesting things is if a plane crashes right now, all of you will probably see a video of it within 10 or 15 minutes. Maybe within five minutes. You'll probably see multiple videos of it. When we were growing up, you had to wait till the next day in the newspaper to hear something horrible had happened or something good had happened. Today it's not that way. So what I would say is use social media. <coughs> use it for the good. You can create your own groups to say, look, we stand up against people who want to ridicule us for being involved in this activity or how we look or what we're involved with. And all of those can be ridiculed and I'm sure that that some of you have been ridiculed for what you do, how you look, or who you associate with. But use it for the good. Create those groups, get people together and say, hey look, we don't believe in this and we want to increase our group. If you don't believe in uh, ridiculing people and making fun of people, please join our group. There are strength in numbers, so you can use social media to kind of push back on people. I do it in my job. On Facebook, I get maybe 100, 200, some good days. I get three or 400 bad comments about me. So I push back on that. And I use my Facebook page to say, these are all the good things that we're doing. If you want to be stuck in the negative and, and stuck on this one thing, then fine. But look at these 20 things that we are working on that are helping people on a daily basis. Look at how many people we talk to today. I'll talk to in my office over a hundred people a day trying to help them with problems, trying to help them with services. So use it to push back on them. Don't just sit there and take what social media brings in the bad, push it back on a good thing. Thank you. Now, uh, now Dr. Kaplinsky would like to comment on this as well. I just, I, this is probably the issue that's most near and dear to my heart because when I, um, chose to be an educator, it was really about the care of students that drove me to do that. I had training in other areas and education in another field before I became a teacher. I think that um, social media is, well, I've done my best to keep up. Um, I'm engaged in social media. I learned that um, when my two grown sons accepted my Facebook requests for friend requests that they were no longer using Facebook. Yes. So <laughs> I'm trying to keep up. But I, I think that um, what's really important to be said about this is that um, if, if we think about social media, and I, I would ask all of you to, to think about this, because we've all posted something. We've all posted somewhere. There is a beautiful Sufi prayer that is, um, a, it's a tribe that they talk about when they use words that they pass three gates. One of them is that, is it true? And if you don't know if it's true, you shouldn't be posting it. The second thing is, is it necessary? And the third thing is, is it kind? And I think that if we all just thought about those three simple rules before we went to social media and posted anything about our peer group, about another adult, anything, this would, this would end. And I think that I call upon adults as well and parents because we are sometimes a horrible example of the kind of behavior on Facebook and other social media outlets that we don't want our children to replicate, but we're doing it. And I'm all for like using social media responsibly, as the congressman said, I use it often. But I think that if we, if we would just take in some simple um, ideas and ideals of kindness when we take to social media, we would not be having the kind of issues that we're having. When you leave here today, I'm gonna um, ask all of you to go um, onto YouTube and look up a video. You can just Google search this. It's a Dove body campaign. 
And um, if anybody has seen this, it's really beautiful. It's about um, being um, really critical of ourselves and our own body image. And what they did is they took two complete strangers and they sat them in a room together. They didn't communicate, they just sat in the room together and they were asked just to kind of study the person's face. And then separately they went to two forensic artists and um, that forensic artist asked them to describe themselves as he drew them. And then they swapped and they asked that same question to describe the person they were sitting with. And the two images are remarkably different. We are so critical on ourselves and we need to stop being our own worst critics. And you know, when we talk about being kind to others, you need to be kind to yourself first. And those two images, when you see them, you're gonna be shocked because the way that people describe, them, describe themselves is less beautiful, it's less honoring of themselves. And so the message is, is that we are much more difficult on ourselves than really people see us. And so I would encourage you to go watch that. Um, it's a really touching ad campaign and I appreciate that um, there are um, you know, um, um, products out there now and product lines that are trying to show more realistic figures in their ad campaigns, they're trying to honor what a real body looks like. And you have all seen, when you check out of an aisle, all of this, you know, the globe and the star and all of this garbage, right? They would stop making it if we stopped buying it. So we have a responsibility to that. And I would just tell you, if you're a young person and you're faced with those kind of challenges, just know that healthy comes in all kinds of body shapes. Emotional health comes in all kinds of body shapes. It's not an excuse not to be healthy because you need to be healthy, you need to be active. But you are responsible for what you put in and out of your body and what you get out of it. And as um, I think it was um, Audrey Hepburn that said that the prettiest people are the happiest people. And so if you are happy with yourself, that will emote, uh, emote to other people. So I would just say that social media is a real danger Parents, you need to be aware of what's going on. And remember that most of these social media outlets that you get onto, you have to, in many cases, young people have to lie to even get an account. So there's something wrong with that. Remember, uh, what was it before? It was not MySpace. I mean, every young person that had MySpace had a, an account that said they were 18 years old. Well, that was not the case. So there, was, there is a reason um, that parents need to be involved. And if if you're a parent and your child's devices have locks on them that you can't get into, I would caution you against that. There is no place in my house that was off limits to me. Um, and if my, if, when my sons ha, you know, got their first cell phones and all of that, um, if I couldn't have gotten on them, they would not have had them. So you need to be involved in that if you're an adult with children. That's my two cents on that. <laughs> <laughs> The age of modern technology has led to kids that grow up in a very different online world with a new set of challenges such as cyberbullying and negative body image. What advice can you give to the youth of today so that they can be safe online and use it in a positive way? Well, what I can add that uh, my two colleagues haven't, <laughs> are, haven't already said, um, the, the social media wasn't, when I was growing up, wasn't around. Okay, and uh, the, there are people out there that are negative people. They're just negative. They always see the glass half empty, okay? And um, the social media is a wonderful thing that we have now, but it's also a dangerous thing. And I go back, because I served on the city council from 1980 to 84, well, we didn't have social media. So the contacts that I have today <laughs> have uh, just mushroomed in terms of people contacting me and making comments one way or the other. And like Congressman Knight, there are people that are very negative and like to take shots. We didn't used to have to deal with that before when I was on the council in the 80s because we didn't have social media. I'm sharing that with you for a reason because I think it's analogous to the, the questions that we've talked about, about people demeaning people or bullying people on social media because it's so easy to do. It's just, you just put some stuff in and hit it, and then people have anonymous uh, uh, media, some, some people that are really nasty. And, you know, the key to this whole thing, and it's been touched on by my two colleagues, is having a sense of, of who you are, and being proud of who you are, because we're all God's creatures, and we're all different. And we bring to the table different things, okay? And, you know, the people that are critical are going to be critical no matter what you do. 
It's just the way it is because they're negative, all right? It's how you deal with it that's important. And if you have a good sense of who you are and you, and you surround you with people that, that are positive like you, that will uplift you and you will uplift them, it'll make a huge difference because they won't be able to get to you because they just blow it off. And I say that because the, the congressman and, my, and I deal with this all, all the time. And it, some of it is really nasty and negative, okay? And, and I, some of it I just, I just blow off. I mean, I, I respond because I don't ignore people, but my, my, my response isn't getting into the dialogue with them because that just makes it worse because you're, 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 you're buying into their negativity. Just keep a positive, try to shut it down, and, and move on. Director Kavanaugh, what programs do the, does the Recreation and Park District offer for teens that can encourage us to get up off our phones and go outside to learn new skills and make new friends? Wonderful. This is an area I can answer to. <laughs> okay. Um, parks and Recreation. How many of you know how many parks we have? We have over 50 parks that we handle in the community of Simi Valley and Oak Park. We have 80 trails that you can walk. And we have over 6,000 acres of open space. I think you have a little bit of area to get out, don't you? <laughs> okay. One of the biggest things that I have been asked about recently as a director of the park district is when are we going to put Wi-Fi in the parks? My answer is never. Okay. And if you don't want to vote for me next time, that's okay. But, you know, that's not, that's not what a park is for. Um, a park and our recreation facilities are for you as a person, as an individual, as a team, as a family, is to get outside or to exercise and have fun. It doesn't matter what skill level you're at. It doesn't matter if you can run a 5K. I can do a 50 yard and that's about it. But it's, it's like they said, it's everyone is healthy at your own pace, at your own size. The, the thing is to be healthy person, that you don't have to be 100 pounds to be healthy. You don't have to be six foot five, you know, and, and big shouldered to be healthy. You have to be healthy inside, like Dr. Peplinski said, and that's what you eat, that's the exercise that you do, um, that, that's who you are. And one of the, the other things I, I think we should do is always surround yourself with positive people, like, like the mayor said. I recently have started working with somebody who is probably one of the kindest, most nicest, naturally good people that I've ever met. And she's making me improve myself. I no longer say anything negative first, I say a positive first. I think about what I'm going to say before I say it. And I never, you will never find me post a negative comment anywhere. Because why should I? You know, I'm a positive person. I want to be a positive person. So that's how I, I look forward to it, to being a better person, is to be positive. Our park districts, we have the community center that has an indoor gym. We are going to a new location. We are moving our headquarters from the Sycamore office to a new building on Guardian Street. That will enable us to have more indoor facilities. We will have four racquetball courts, four pickleball courts, a climbing wall, um, I think two full basketball courts. I'm not sure. So more facilities and more um, areas that you are able to access. If I get back to the trails, if you come into um, the community center or our headquarters, we have packets of brochures that list all 80 trails and list their um, severities, the length of them, how difficult they are, um, key points to them. Those were nicely put together by the trailblazers here in Simi Valley who help us maintain our trails. So there are a lot of opportunities out there for you to use. Who um, saw on, well, you guys probably don't use Facebook anymore. You're young. <laughs> I'm old. I'm on Facebook. So one of the things uh, somebody posted today, and they got it out before I could, we opened our new golf disc park today. So that is at Sycamore Park, which is off, off of Tracy Avenue. So that's free. That's open to the public. Um, it's a park that was not being fully utilized. So we had been asked about disc golf. How many of you know what disc golf is? Frisbee golf. Okay, it's like Frisbee golf. So we have set up a full course there. And that was one of the things that the community has asked. That's something you can do with your friends. 
That's something you can do with your family. That's something you can do with your little brothers and sisters. It's just something that all ages can, can enjoy. And I think that's one of the things that I feel is important for the park district to provide to our communities. So that includes you, the youth, it includes uh, you, your families, and it includes um, the adults and such too. So thank you. <laughs> At this time, we'd like to once again ask our social media correspondents uh, any questions that the audience may have for our panelists. To Doc Director. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. Dr. Poblinski, have you noticed a correlation between social media use and depression? Well, I, yeah, absolutely. I think it's well documented. Um, there's actually, you know, that's the other thing about today's age is we have data on everything. Um, going back to the DARE question earlier, there was actually data on DARE. And you know the, the D.A.R.E. program was great. We had it. We loved it. Everybody in our city that went through um, our elementary schools went through the D.A.R.E. program, and yet some of them ended up in drug addiction. So there's data on all these programs. So yes, absolutely, they are directly correlated. And I think that the other thing, too, is that who goes to Facebook ever or whatever you're on now? Who goes to Facebook? I certainly don't go there for a toxic experience. So when I see things on my feed that don't align with my like, personal health or my you know, goal to be positive and to spread kindness, I hide that. So we, you have a responsibility as well. If you're going there and you're made to feel um, poor about yourself, um, then you have, a, you have the right to take that down. And you don't have to have Facebook. You don't have to have Snapchat. You don't have to have these things. So um, I would say that um, in terms of depression, uh, one of the things I want to make sure all of our students are aware of is that um, with the help of the mayor and the police department, the um, school district has prepared, and some of you may have already seen it, but a talk about um, depression and suicidal tendency, tendencies. So we know for a fact that in two instances already, because of going through that seminar, um, classmates of, of a student have reported a concern to a counselor, and we know that we've gotten those students help. And I want to make sure that we're clear on one thing. If you have a concern, you don't have to be 100% sure or right to go to an adult. Okay, that concern is enough for you to go to someone and just say, hey, could someone check this out? That, that's all you need to do. And you know, depression, we all know what to look for in our friends you know, when we're looking for um, you know, drastic changes in their mood or their appearance or if they're kept differently than they have been in the past. Those are signs that something may be going on in your friend's life that they can't communicate, they aren't comfortable to communicate. And I would just implore you all to, you know, take that information to an adult. And as I said, you don't have to be 100% sure. Um, the, the real tragedy would be is that if you were on to something and you didn't share it. To Director Kavanaugh, how can we help students focus on the more positive aspects of social media? I'm sorry, the first part? How can we help students focus on the more positive aspects of social media? Ooh, how can we help fo students focus yes. on social media? Well, I think my first thing would be stop posting negative. Um, when, you, when you post something negative, it creates a trail of negativity that never goes away. Um, it start if you have something that was a negative, can you post it or turn it around a little bit and maybe offer a solution at the same time or um, avoid the negativity of it and maybe look at a positive side of it? That's kind of where I'm going. Um, it, it's hard because that social media is such a part of your life. And I think you are all involved in it so much that it's, sometimes it's hard to step back and Take a minute. How many of you have ever been taught to, to count to 10 before you say something? Uh, that's a very important thing. Apply to that to your media. <laughs> count to 20? I go to 12. I go to 12, okay, yeah, that's about it. But if you try and apply that to what you're posting, that might help. It might give you that second thought. When I have something, um, I supervise a lot of people. And if I have something I have to address negatively, it's not social media, but it's email, okay? I will write it. And I will wait five minutes and go back and reread it. Because I have to think about how are you interpreting what I'm posting, as well as am I getting across what it is that I need to get across. So that might help in, if you apply, the, that's a business 
techn technique, if you apply that business technique into your social media posting, I think that might help. Thank you. As the near future of college looms over all of us high school students, we'd like to jump into the next topic voted by you guys, concerns related to higher education. Our first question goes to Dr. Jason Poplinski, who has two doctorate degrees and a medical degree, which is, which is a hefty accomplishment, but that was also very expensive. So my question is, <laughs> how can we help students know all the financial aid programs and the scholarship opportunities that are available? Yeah, um, th this is a real struggle for me, and I'll tell you, um, if you're listening, to, we have a presidential election coming up, and you're listening to candidates talk about this topic, you're going to be voting age soon. And that's why it's so important that whichever side of an argument you are on, that you hear, that you vote. Because, you know, we're going to be deciding things um, in this country that are really big deals going forward. Um, in terms of education, you know, the topic right now is being discussed is should junior college be free for all um, students in, in California? And we had a conversation in the green room about this. Um, I was fortunate enough to do part of my doctoral studies in Finland where everything is free. In fact, um, an American student now could go to Finland next year and do their, you know, their graduate work or their undergraduate work for free. Finland will pay for it for you. And um, about 89% of Finnish people have a, a bachelor's degree or higher. And I think that um, in terms of the cost of education, um, this, we, the conversation we were having earlier about is this a right or is it a privilege? Well, I really struggle with that because what you're in now, this system you're in now, is a right. And we don't take full advantage of the system we're in now. So if everybody was afforded the opportunity to go to college, would we have more students going? Likely, yes. Um, I will tell you that having paid off literally over $300,000 of student loans from all my various degrees, um, my mom keeps telling me, you own that education. Yes, I do. <laughs> I own that education. Um, I, but I think the cost has gotten so astronomical that we have, um, by virtue of, of even the state system now, have eliminated the option for so many students. Um, and I think that um, I w had the good fortune of being a principal at an elementary school um, that was Title I, which was, um, they're considered a low income school. And having conversations with a fifth or a sixth grader and they have no concept or dream of college because they don't see it as a potential reality for their family is very sad for me. There are so many resources out there. And um, I have a good friend right now who's finishing vet school got her entire vet um, program paid for because she enlisted in the Army for four years. So the Army, she's going to take care of the military horses. It's kind of a cool job. She will have to do basic training, but um, she will be um, debt free after vet school. There are um, an extraordinary amount of resources in your college and career counseling offices at all of the high schools. You have people dedicated to helping you find and secure, secure scholarships. And there are scholarships for so many things. I was a twin. I am a twin. Um, and when I graduated from high school, there were scholarships specific to twins. And um, I applied for a Colgate toothbrake, toothpaste scholarship in high school. There, are, there is a lot of money out there. And um, we have people dedicated in your schools to help you find that. The other thing that I will tell you, and this is just the reality, is that some of you won't escape having to take out student loans, right? Um, there are very creative ways for you to work off some of that student debt. Um, well, I was fortunate enough to have both academic and athletic scholarship in college, but I became an RA in college, and that paid for all my room and board for three years that I was an RA. You can do work study at most of these schools, and these are not difficult things to obtain because likely um, you will qualify. There are things that you can do also if your family does make more money than others and when you're applying to school, when you apply to school, you can be very creative about how you do that. And if um, your parents um, don't qualify for student loans, you can qualify for student loans simply by having your parents not claim you on their taxes. So those are the kind of things that you will learn in our college and career centers. So go, we have great people in there. Ms. Kavanaugh's daughter is actually um, a high school counselor at Simi Valley High School. And these offices have a plethora of material and information. I know that um, the Reagan uh, Library 
hosts events here every spring for our Reagan scholars. And um, every year we're so um, extraordinarily impressed by the number of students that um, express a need. So we know it's out there, but you can be very creative about that. Get into those counseling centers and um, you know, those people are there dedicated to help you find that money. Thank you. Mayor Huber, with the rise of tuition costs every year, kids are worried that the major and degree that they acquire along with the debt may not be applicable to job. What do you think that the job market will look like in 10 to 15 years from now? That's a, it's an interesting question, but I have pondered it a little bit because I watched the computers taking over the world because a lot of jobs that are here now will not be here 10 to 15 years from now. I'm a lawyer. Lawyers that do litigation will be around. Lawyers that do transactional work, meaning contracts, probate, that kind of stuff, there won't be that many of them because everything will be online. Uh, they have this thing called legal Zoom now, right now. Uh, my wife is a retired bank vice president. What's happening with the banks right now? And Edie Kavanaugh is a vice president, and she knows this. Pretty soon, we have banks everywhere. We had five Chase banks, okay, in our town. Someday, there'll just be one bank in a region, because they're all encouraging you to go online, because machines are taking over people's jobs, okay? And um, it's just a fact of life. Uh, about six, seven months ago, I had, uh, had lunch with the editor of our county paper, and I, I, what I do is I get up in the morning, have my paper in my hands, and have a cup of coffee. That's how I start my day every day. I have since a young, young uh, businessman here in town. And um, I asked him, I said, what's the future on the papers? He says, if the print papers, 10 or, 10 or 12 years from now, they won't be around, OK? Just because the computers are taking over everything. So if I were a young person today, I would be looking forward in terms of what's, what kind of jobs are available in the future, because the ones that are here now are not going to be here 10 or 15 years from now, okay? Now there's jobs, though. We t now we go into, I, I was a college trustee for, for six years, uh, which is, the, we ran the, the three colleges here in the county, and I chaired the college board my last two years, okay? And we were... We, we were very aggressive, and I haven't been there for six years, so I'm, I'm not up to speed now, but we were very on top of voc vocational education because there's some jobs that pay good money that'll never go away because a machine can't take over those jobs. So I would look, if I were preparing for a career, I would do a little bit of research in terms of the longevity of that particular job, and I've given a ex couple examples where I think that there's not going to be that that many, uh, many employees, okay, or, or people who have businesses because it's of, of the computers. So I would be looking at the future, and if I were, if I were going through it today, one of the things I'd be really studying, studying hard is, are jobs where a computer won't, won't uh, displace me down the line. So that would be the, the one piece of advice I think of, that I would, I would heed if I were your age today. And again, there are jobs that will be here forever, like I talked in my business, uh, litigation, meaning in the courtroom, you can't have a machine litigate a, a trial with a jury, okay? But a lot of it's going by the boards. And that's true, I'm thinking too. Congressman Steve Knight, with your busy schedule, you know full well what it means to be overwhelmed with all that is on to your to-do list. What advice can you give to busy teens that sometimes bite off more than they can chew with school and our seeming interests? Do what you can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody gets busy, and, and busy people want to be busy. Uh, if you're in a position like the panel is, we're busy. We like to be busy. We want to accomplish things. We want to change things. We want to make things better for people. That's, that's what busy people look to do in a day. So I would say that, you know, as I tell my staff, I have a thousand things to do, but I gotta make sure that I get some things accomplished every day, every week, every month. So if I don't get to my thousand things that I need to do, 
Well, we need to make sure that we're getting some things accomplished. So, I like busy people. I like you to get up in the morning and, and have a mission and have a goal and try, and try and produce something. I think that those people are, have a vision and they, they want to do something. They don't want to just lay around the house and, and uh, play with the dogs, even though I love doing that with my three dogs. But um, I like having busy people, so I, I think that's one of the reasons I'm in this position. But I, wanna, I also want to answer the, the uh, college question, too. Uh, I have two children that are, one's in college, one's going into college. So, in fact, last night I was on the FAFSA. And for all of you seniors or parents that don't know what FAFSA is, you will. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's like an SAT uh, test to fill out the FAFSA. And that's basically to get money through the federal government so that your child can go to school and have a loan. Uh, I'm in a position where I can help my kids and hopefully pay for a lot of their education. They're both going to state schools. But they're also going to have to go through this loan process. And my senior, who's graduating from Cal State uh, Sacramento, will have a little bit of a loan that he's going to have to figure out and he's going to have to pay for. There's also another option there, too. You can work when you're going to college. I know that probably everyone on this panel worked when they went to college. I know I did, and I worked at some not so great jobs. But I wanted to make sure that I could pay for the things that I wanted to do in college, and I wanted to help out paying for my college. So that is an option, too. Um, but understand that, that college is, is an opportunity for you to get a position that maybe some other people can't get. The higher you get educated, it's been shown by the data, probably, for the majority, you're going to make money, more money. If you get your high school education, there's certain opportunities. If you get your associate's degree all the way up to your, to your uh, PhD, there are certain opportunities that are afforded to you. And with those opportunities, it typically means more money, and in some cases, a lot more money if you get to a PhD level. So, uh, I encourage young people to go to school, but I also encourage them that there's other opportunities. I, I think that, uh, that going to the military and having your, your college paid for and serving is a great option. And I think that a lot of young people don't look at that. Um, and then community colleges are a good option there too. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that uh, being busy and making sure that you're trying to accomplish missions is a great thing. And, uh, and I encourage you to be busy. Have a mission. Accomplish something. It makes you, uh, makes you happy to get up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Director Kavanaugh, with all the increasing competition in the job market, kids are even more pressured to pick a career path from early on. What can you suggest to kids that are exploring career options as of now? Exploring career options. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do it. One of the first things I would say is ask adults. I think usually when you're in elementary school, you probably have a, a, an essay that you have to do on somebody uh, that in your family and what they did with their life and their, and their jobs. So that's a first early, easy way to do it. But the most important way that I feel is to start volunteering or to look at the different areas where you can uh, get a taste of what that job entails. Example, ROTC. You, uh, Simi Valley High School has the HOSA program, the, the health occupational. Um, you can volunteer at Simi Valley Hospital. You can volunteer at the Parks and Recreation Department. We have over 600 volunteers, and they range in age from 13 and up. So you can try different things within our park district. You could try our after school clubs. You could try our summer schools. You could try working our events. You could look at the different um, sports venues that we have. You can try all the different things that are out there just in our small community. There are also a lot of other volunteer opportunities. You can intern somewhere. You can try, um, we have bank interns that will come in and work. The county offers an ROP program, I believe they still do, um, regional occupation, to try the different areas to see if it's something that you want to do. There's nothing wrong with looking at one area and this is what you want to do, and then maybe possibly changing it later. 
as long as it's something that you have a passion for and that you're going to enjoy. I'll cheat on my daughter a little bit. She did that to me. She was um, finished her junior year in college and then came home and said, Mom, I don't want to be a teacher anymore. And I'm like, I don't care. Just get your degree. And, and so that was the, the big thing right then. It was just finish your college degree. She goes, well, that's okay. I want to be a high school counselor. And so that required a master's degree. But it took her three years of going through the educational program to find out that that really was not exactly what she wanted to do. And that's okay because she still had the education. She had gotten to that point to where she was able to make it, to change her mind and decide on something that she really did have a passion for and that wanted to do, that she wanted to do. I can use myself as an example. I grew up in a law enforcement family. Um, we have over 100 years of law enforcement service in my family. So what do you think I wanted to be when I was growing up? I wanted to be a cop. So my whole life, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a cop. Started, uh, went to Moore Park College, started in their criminal justice program, and said, oh, I don't think this is what I want to do. You have to go work in the dark. You have to go down dark hallways or dark alleys. Nah, that's not for me. I'm going to go work in an office. So y you just have to try things sometimes to decide what it is you want to do. And experience is the best teacher, and I think your teachers will probably all tell you that. And so that's probably the best way to decide what it is you want to do. Once again, we'd like to turn our attention towards our social media correspondents uh, to ask just a few more questions on the topic from our audience. For any of our panelists, some students would rather pursue employment after high school. What vocational education resources are available? Well, there are a lot in our town, and if you haven't um, heard of our adult school, they have one of the few places in um, the state, Southern California, that you can actually get a welding credential, a welding certificate. It's an extremely lucrative job, and some of the um, underwater um, welding jobs, they make well over $100,000 a year. And it does require some additional training in the vocational area past um, high school. So I would definitely check out the Simi Valley Adult School. Um, cosmetology licenses are also provided there. There's dental assistance. Everything you can imagine the adult school probably offers. So it does, it does require additional um, education, but not in the form of a degree. Um, oftentimes that comes in the form of a certificate. So I would check those out. Again, to Dr. Plabinski, will the district ever offer courses such as money management in the high schools? Yes, this is, um, this is a great um, conversation that we're having right now. I actually received an email from um, a parent asking, could we incorporate kind of like a basic skills financial aspect to a required course in high school? Um, the, the, the quick answer to that, would, that would be amazing, is how we fit it into your course schedules with a required list of graduation requirements and state requirements is the difficult part. So likely what we would um, want to be doing is looking at our current economics class, which is a state requirement, and how do we build in um, you know, those kind of basic financial skills into that course? I know that when my sons both went off to college for the first time, um, the first time that my youngest son had to write a check, um, I'm embarrassed to say he did not know how to fill out a check because he simply had never had to do it. He had never kept a bank register because everything was electronic online. Um, so he had a bank card from the time he was a junior in high school, but he had never kept a register. It was always online, but he had to write a physical check. So I think some of those things um, need to find their way into our curriculum. And we do have some courses where some of that naturally fits, like the economics course, for example. Um, but the other neat thing that's happened um, for anybody that's uh, started high school at um, either of the three comprehensive schools lately there are new courses, the MAP course at Simi Valley High School and the TAP course at Santa Susana High School. And now with the service learning projects and the, um, the academies that are developing at Royal High School, there's an opportunity to put some of this kind of life skill stuff into um, the daily schedule. So I, I do think it's a great question. It's a great suggestion. And it is something that we um, you know, are trying to figure out a way to work into your already packed schedule. So. move on to the final portion of today, the social media rapid fire question round. In this round, audience members will get to ask questions and then the panelists will answer.
for Congressman Knight. Why is college so expensive? <laughs> Why is college so expensive? Yeah. It is. It is. So my, uh, my senior in high school is a very good swimmer, and he's being uh, recruited by certain schools to come with a swimming scholarship. So the very first thing I do is I reach out to the, the coach, and uh, we get a little dialogue, and then I find out uh, where the school is and how much it is. And then the last question is, how much of a scholarship are you going to offer? <laughs> because if the school is $60,000 a year and you're going to offer me a 10% scholarship, <laughs> hmm, I'm on the hook for 54 grand a year. So uh, those, are, those are important questions. When I went to school, uh, I was coming out of the Army and I was just looking for a school that was close to the beach. Uh, that was kind of my criteria. So I applied to San Diego and Long Beach State and Long Beach State took me. Today they probably wouldn't because they've raised their criteria so much that I'm sure they would have looked at my grades and said, nope, we're not taking that guy. Send him to San Diego. Um, but it is, it is imperative that we look at school and make sure that there is as many opportunities for kids, for students who want to go to school as can be. You can't do a whole lot about a private institution that wants to charge you $250,000 for your bachelor's degree. There's something up there that's funny, right? This is all. <laughs> that's great. What is your favorite? <laughs> but we can do things. We can do things at the state level. We can do things at the community college level. Here in California, as I would say, it is still expensive to go to school. It is. But be lucky that you're in California. You have 111 community colleges in California. And it is still one of the most inexpensive community college systems in the country, with some of the best community colleges in the country right here in California. So that is an option to kind of keep your, your debt down. You can go to community college for a couple of years, and then you can go to a four-year university for your final two years. Uh, that is one way, working, obviously. <coughs> but the legislature at the state level and the federal level have been kind of kicking this back and forth for the last 10 or 20 years of what do we do. And, and I think that it was hit earlier that the presidential election has been talking about education and talking about just this subject. So I believe in the next couple of years, if we don't get a rein on this, and we don't say that there's got to be some sort of limitations on what schools can charge, and, and maybe looking at their balance sheets, and, and what are you getting out of this? Do you really need to, uh, to build more brick and mortar, or can you uh, have more online courses? Can we make online courses a little bit cheaper? Can we have more counseling for online courses? Because I know myself, I've taken an online course, hardest course I ever took in my life. It involves self-discipline. That's why it's hard. Uh, so there are ways that we can do this. But right now, it is very expensive to go to college. Uh, I know I'm living that dream with two, uh, with two boys. Uh, so this is one of the issues that is going to affect this country for a very long time, unless we get some rain on it. For all the panelists, what would you do if your child developed a drug abuse problem? Since I have a 17-year-old and a 22-year-old. So a couple things that I talk to my sons on about a weekly, monthly basis is uh, drugs, stupidity, and money. Those are, those are three big issues, in my opinion. So drugs, I always talk to them. Uh, I always say, you know, what's happening in your life? I, I know just about every friend that my 17-year-old has, uh, and I kind of screen them a little bit and, and help my son make good decisions about friends. Uh, that goes into the second category of stupidity. Uh, don't bring home bad friends to my house, uh, because I'm going to figure it out really quickly. But you got to talk to your kids.
kids all the time, even if they're old, 22 is my oldest, you still got to talk to them because they still need some, some guidance in life. I'm going to be 50 this year. Uh, both of my parents have passed on, but I guarantee if my parents were alive today, they would still be giving me guidance. They would still be talking about, probably in my case, the second category the most, about stupid decisions. But that is what a parent is supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be looking out for you, giving you good advice. So I talk to my 17-year-old all the time about marijuana use, about are kids in your area doing cocaine? Are they doing heroin? Are they doing meth? And you got to say these, these terms to them. You can't beat around the bush. And I talk about a lot of other issues. With my 22-year-old, it's more about money. Uh, why, when I go to Taco Bell, it, talk, it takes me $7, and when you go there, it costs you $15? Um, so I think that that's a vital part. I believe that some parents think that once your kid is 16, 17 years old, well, I'm pretty much done. Now, actually, it gets harder at that point. And if you're not talking to them, they'll make some decisions that maybe they didn't have the guidance and they're making bad decisions. So uh, that's what I do with my kids, and that's what I tell people is if you're not involved with your kids and you're not talking to them, sometimes they'll make bad decisions, and, and sometimes some of those decisions involve drugs or peer pressure or doing something that you know is just not good for them. And I'll tell you all kids out there right now, you're going to have best friends in life, but your parents or your grandparents will always look out for the best. They'll always look out for your best. So you can always trust that they're going to help you in life. And not that your best friends won't help you in life, but your parents and your grandparents will always say, you know, this is the best for you. So kind of listen to them once in a while. This question is for Mayor Huber. What are some programs that can prepare us for work in the real world? Well, the programs, uh, we, we kind of all talked about it when we're talking about uh, jobs. The programs are out there. You just have to determine what your goals are. And as you get older, I, I determined, my first career, I determined what I wanted to do when I was 13 years old, OK? And, uh, and I planned everything based on that. The, the, my undergraduate was in business because I wanted to have my own business. I, I was a funeral director. Then I went to mortuary college. and. Uh, so I planned it all out. So you're not, you're not too young to start planning what you want to do, OK? You can think it out, do your research, and uh, set some goals, like the, like the Congressman Knight was saying. Uh, that, that, for me, worked, OK? I did change careers. Um, after doing the one for 13 years, I did change. And I planned that out. And uh, it's tougher today, though, when you have to go to school and you have, you're raising a family, and you're having to pay tuition, and what have you. Because when I went to law school, that's the way it was for me. I didn't have a scholarship, had two, two young sons, and, uh, but I, but, and I didn't take student loans. I was fortunate enough to be able to, to plan it. It's all, it's all a matter of planning. So you have career guidance, as Dr. Polinsky said. You have career guidance people available. There's also career guidance people available in the community college system. Uh, but it's better to start young. And, and think through what you want to do. Now, it's interesting because a lot of people that uh, are in a four-year call, I went to four years of the same college, a lot of them don't decide what they want to do until they get to their last year. And I think that's way, way, way too late. You should plan it out. I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you, this is, your, this is how you take care of yourself, is with your career. That's how you pay your bills and have you, how you have the extra things in life. And, uh, but there, it doesn't necessarily mean all, all uh, uh, community college or four-year colleges. I mean, there's, there's voc, voc ed available right now in the, in the uh, Sumivali Unified School District. 
really depends on what you want to do. And some of you know, based on your heritage and what your family, people, and friends, and what have you do, and if you like what they do because you've observed it, what your dad does or your mom does or what have you. So just start, start thinking ahead in terms of what you want to do and then plan it out. That's what I did, and it worked for me. Thank you. We'll take one more question. Dr. Poplinski, does the district have a plan to promote body image positivity in our schools? A plan. Let me think about what we currently have in place and what discussions have been had around this area. Um, I would say that um, in terms of what the district um, offers is oftentimes partnered with our um, parent organizations. So um, for example, the PTSA um, is hosting pretty soon coming up here for starting I think in sixth grade, an A, an a through G requirements night, what is that? Um, last year we did a social media night with them. And so maybe this is a topic that we, um, because it is one that the council has brought forward as a, a viable topic is, I encourage the PTSA Association next year to host their nights on this topic. Um, I think there's a lot of wonderful uh, information and speakers that we could probably bring in this area to, <laughs> to, um, to address that, that, um, that need. And I'm actually glad I'm here today because when we got the list of topics, I was um, not shocked to see drug and alcohol abuse or college um, but I was a little um, surprised to see body image as something that um, so many of you brought to um, the attention of your youth council representative. So I think it's an area that the, the district will um, need to explore a bit further, but initial thought is that we would involve the, the council, the PTSA council, in providing um, their, their, um, their uh, programming around that particular area. This is for all the panelists. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? <laughs> Chocolate. <laughs> Cappuccino. <laughs> I'm, I like vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> Goes better with all the toppings. <laughs> Turkey dough. <laughs> 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 Now this time I'd like to ask if any of the panelists have, would like to say a final word. What I'd just like, like to thank the Youth Council and the Reagan Library for putting this together. It's um, been very informative and um, anytime we can have a group of young people together, I'm all for it, so. And I as well would like to thank the Youth Council. I know you spent a lot of time organizing this and uh, it's a job well done on behalf of the young people. It makes us proud of our youth. And also again, I'd like to thank the uh, Reagan Library for hosting this. Like everyone else, uh, thank you for inviting me. This is my first time here, and it's nice to be able to share the park district with you um, and let you know what amenities we have available. And it was very interesting to see the concerns that you have um, and to bring them to our attention so that as community leaders, we can help you accomplish what it is that you're setting out to do. So thank you. Well, I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you to the uh, Reagan Library. And uh, this has been an, an interesting and exciting uh, couple hours. If you don't talk to students, then you probably don't know what's coming. So I think that this is uh, always important. I'll put this out, and, and I've talked to the superintendent many times on this. Uh, I try and visit 60 schools a year. So if you've got a school, and you all do, <laughs> that would like me to come speak in front of your uh, civics class, your history class, your, uh, uh, please don't let me speak in front of your math class, but uh, <laughs> something like that, uh, I am available to come speak in front of your, uh, your classroom and give you an update of what's happening in Congress or what's not happening in Congress, and uh, thank you very much for the day.
Well, we would like to thank our panelists for being here and spending their time with us today to answer our questions. So thank you very much. We would also like to thank the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation for allowing us to host our event here today. It's a wonderful venue and we enjoy coming here. And we'd also like to thank the City of Simi Valley for allowing us to host this event, as well as the Simi Valley Unified School District for allowing you all to join us today.